Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current version of my Sunday sermon. It's been a short week. Sermon might change a little bit before Sunday, but here we go. Two weeks ago, not last week, two weeks ago, we talked about um, to make us holy through Moses, through Paul, to Corinth, to us. Christianity asserts that our work and Paul and Paul's participates in world saving. Now, as I mentioned two weeks ago, what exactly that means, people are a little foggy on. In fact, it's remarkably hard to talk about what it would mean to save the world. Most ideas are, well, maybe no Holocaust, maybe no, um, maybe no environmental disasters, maybe, but, but to say what exactly the world should be like is a lot tougher. Now, Paul has been moving around the Roman Empire, and one of the churches that he planted was in Corinth, a rather notorious town at a critical nexus in the Roman Empire's uh, shipping network that basically kept Rome fed. And there's a group of maybe 50 to 100 people that are in Corinth that one way or another participate or identify with the church. And basically from the book, of first and second Corinthians they don't look like good candidates for a prototype as we saw two weeks ago at the beginning Paul talks about to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people the further you get into the book you realize that the set apartness doesn't seem very set apart the Corinthians are basically acting and behaving a lot like a lot of other people in Corinth would, and Paul has a list of complaints. They squabble over which teacher is best. They practice Roman sexual and marital ethics. One man is even sleeping with his father's wife, something that would have been um, something that even Romans wouldn't tolerate. Um, and and people are, you know, people are celebrating it. Uh, they fight in Roman courts. There's questions about marriage. And, and really naughty and difficult questions about how do they relate to the public religion, the imperial cult of Rome and the other pagan temples that are very much knit in together with um, regular society. How do they manage that? There's fights over status between each other, and there's fights about miracles and oracles. Now, many seem to believe that the best way to save the world is to shame people into a particular political posture. Um, two articles that I recently skimmed from places say, which to me seemed quite obvious, no, that really doesn't work. Shaming someone for their privilege is unlikely to change their politics, psychologists say, says Salon. And Vox says, research, research says that there are ways to reduce racial bias. Calling people racist isn't one of them, which again would seem rather obvious. But these tend to be the tactics that all kinds of people employed today to try to save the world one way or another. Now, to this very problematic church, Paul crafts a Thanksgiving section. Um, most of Paul's letters had a Thanksgiving section. I went and looked at the letter to the Galatians, which is a particularly strident letter and doesn't really have one. But this is what Paul writes to this problematic church. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God, thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now notice how many times Christ and Jesus Christ are mentioned in there. Now you've got a little local cluster of 50 to 100 people in a pretty important city. There are 60 to 80 million people in the Roman Empire, maybe close to 100,000 who live in Corinth. Rome was the largest city with, with um, upwards of a million people. Now, there are actually more Christian Reformed people living in the city of Sacramento than there were Christians participating in the church in Corinth. This is a very tiny beginning in a very small movement. And Paul and the other New Testament authors seem crazy optimistic about their profit, about their prospects. 
the behavior and condition of the people in places like Corinth and Galatia, the Galatian churches notwithstanding. Many people have noted that there are actually sort of three graces in his letter. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and all knowledge. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift. They've been given speech and knowledge. They've been given spiritual gifts and so that they may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The difficulty, of course, is that if you read the rest of the letter, these seem to directly address many of the issues that they have. He says they've been given all kinds of speech with all kinds of knowledge, but they're fighting using words and they feel superior to one another about the knowledge. Um, Paul says you do not lack any spiritual gift. And what he says in the letter is that they boast about their giftedness and play status games because of their miracles and oracles. And he says he'll keep you firm to the end so that you'll be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we've seen, their moral behavior is hardly something to brag about. There are significant moral issues in the church. In fact, the contradictions here are so stark that a few scholars imagine that maybe Paul was being sarcastic with this Thanksgiving. But I don't think so, and the majority of scholars don't think so. So what's going on with this Thanksgiving? Now, what we begin to see from a different point in history is that you have small beginnings in Corinth, and bit by bit by bit, things beginning to change in the life of the people, and that slow evolution will become, well, significant change later on. We begin to see, we begin to see some slow transformation that's going to, bit by bit, creep into the world. It does so through people who very imperfectly embody it, and as it grows, it, becomes, it begins to produce a cumulative impact. And it does so in anticipation of the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those of you who have been watching for a good long time know that this theme of the day of the Lord is a very important theme in the Bible and stands behind all sorts of apocalyptic images, judgment day, but also day of reward and day of glorification and day of consummation. Now, how could Paul be so optimistic? Is such optimism responsible? Now, I mentioned in some of my previous sermons that I had been reading through a long trilogy on the World War II in the Pacific, and I decided that, well, maybe I'll cover the Atlantic as um, my vacations continued. And so I started uh, James Holland's unfinished trilogy about the, the war in the West. First did the war in the East, and now the war in the West. The 20th century was filled with ambitious world-saving regimes. Nazism decided that they needed to exterminate the Jewish people and many other people as well to provide room for their, their budding Superman population. Um, the communists, of course, um, imagined class struggle and thought, sought to prime the pump by um, getting rid of people that were in the way. Imperial Japan was at a particular sort of Japanese ethno-nationalism that um, really became tremendously bloodthirsty as it caused the war in China, which rippled out and had the cascading effect of the war with the United States. And all of this brought immense war and suffering. Um, the one did some genealogies and um, this, this stone in Apping, Appingdon, Netherlands has the names of um, a good number of my distant cousins who um, their great great or their grandfather at that time would be grandfather um, didn't uh, marry the wrong girl and leave the Netherlands and um, go to the Reformed Church in Spring Lake, Michigan. They stayed in the Netherlands and when the Nazis came in, they were wiped out. But for Paul, world saving, this world saving is the work of God in his, the God of Israel in and through history. And despite all of the things, and re now remember, the 20th century was by no means exclusive, or in, if in some ways even exemplar, in terms of bloody wars and massacres and, and genocides in history. 
What Paul highlights is this unique world-saving man. Christ is not an ubermensch. Christ is not class struggle. Christ is not an ethno-nationalist, although he is a Jew whose work fulfills God's mission through Israel to the world. And unlike all other world saviors and human restoration projects, Christ does not, Christ does not um, do so by the blood of his enemies, but in fact, he gives his own blood and life. A little interesting side note, uh, James Holland, whose book's on the Second World War is the brother of Tom Holland, whose cover I used quite used quite frequently frequently on his book Dominion here on my slides. Now this day of the Lord is something that Paul repeats uh, from the Old Testament, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I've talked about that quite a bit over the years. It's a deeply apocalyptic vision that sees personal and global catastrophes as revelatory moments where God reveals the truth about us individually and collectively. The day of the Lord comes to each of us in moments and trials through our life, comes to each of us at the time of our death. It comes to the world at some point in the future, but in events large and small, the day of the Lord sort of ripples through history. And he tells the church in Corinth, the day of the Lord is coming, big and small, and we all get to give an account for what we've done with the time that we've been given. So that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We, in fact, in this fellowship, join him. In Christ's glorification, ours is revealed. We have fellowship in his suffering. We have fellowship in his glory. This isn't simply nature religion where if you do all the right things, you get all the same rewards. This isn't renunciation, simply renunciation religion where the world is simply chaos and so it's your chance to escape. This is, this is a different thing that is promised that we, in fact, are bonded with Christ, that we have fellowship with him both in his suffering and in his glory. Now, the day of the Lord, both the pre-echoes and the, and the consummate moments, um, embody the disrupted and the ruptured break of our sin-bound assumptions. In other words, not only does Christianity seem to grow um, slowly and the kingdom of God grows through the world, through history, there are these apocalyptic events that come and history is disrupted. And Paul, in fact, says, well, this is why you ought to be blameless, ready for these days. Um, the day of the Lord embodies the disrupted and ruptured break with our sin-bound assumptions and our diabolical aspirations to replace and eclipse God. And those are often at the heart of all this historical suffering that we see. We're going to fix the world and the other people who are our enemies are the problems. And so, well, we're going to do it at their expense, sometimes even at their bloodshed. This process isn't isolated to slow historical evolution. But Paul's first word to this church, this problematic church, is in fact thanksgiving. Because in the midst of all the trouble that they have, Paul begins to see the work of Christ revealed in them. The spirit of Christ embodied in them. The participation with Christ, the fellowship with Christ together in their community, no matter how bad and marred and difficult it looks. Now, the Corinthians abuse the three graces given to them that Paul marks out in their strategy or in his thanksgiving. Now, this is a pattern, and this pattern begins in the garden um, in the Garden of Eden, where the man and the woman are given all of these things, and they basically say to God, we want the good stuff, we don't want you, we'll be in charge now, and the world goes as it's been going. God gives us good things, we misuse them, often employing them against each other, which is exactly what Paul sees in the Corinthian church. This sets up cycles and spirals of suffering that also travel through history. And this is what we see. And this is why Christ crucified is central for Paul's teaching among the people. 
He has, Christ, all knowledge, power, and gifts, yet he doesn't set them against us or use them to his advantage against us. He sets them aside to show what is at the heart of all creation, which is this self-donating love. And so it's Christ crucified that stands in the middle of the story, showing all the world what love looks like. And we see that love itself in every mother that gives birth at the, at the risk, if not sacrifice, of her life for her child. The manner in which he does this is on the cross. He exposes us and our sin in that moment. We see that we have blood on our hands. It's not just the Nazis. It's not just the communists. It's not just imperial Japan. We do this in big ways and small with each other, which is exactly what he's pointing out in the church in Corinth. God gives them all these gifts, and they use them against each other for their own status and their own betterment in competition with the others. Christ then rises from the dead, showing our rebellion to be impotent and that he is no captive to death. Now we begin by pointing out the graces present. God gives them, and we must look for them in each other and in our own circumstances. He, in fact, has given us knowledge. He has given us gifts. He is calling us to be holy in anticipation of, of the day of the Lord, the little and the big ones, calling us to be ready so that we may be blameless and we have his promise because we have our fellowship with him. This fellowship, this koinonia, where we practice love for one another, forefronting the relational to the knowledge and the gifts. The moral is also, of course, relational. In these letters, Paul will try to repair his relationship with the church, which has taken a bad turn that he helped found, and while trying to help them mature, to use their knowledge, to use their gifts for one another, to practice between them the kind of love displayed by Christ on the cross and seen in the triune God, that they grow up, mature, into Christ, that they themselves become like Christ, both as individuals and as a community. Christ, who is their head and also their goal for their labors and their longings. We participate in the same labors, overhearing the process that they are engaged with. Now, we have nearly 2,000 years on them. How much more optimistic should we be all of this has learned. We're no longer tiny little groups in Corinth, but we struggle with many of the same issues. The work has far progressed since the small hurdles in the first century, yet we still struggle with all of the same things they do. We will overhear as Paul talks with them, and we will learn from them. He has given us what we need, and he will bring it to completion. Let's begin with thanksgiving, and let's move forward into the work together.